Hello, I'm James Holland and I'm a historian of the Second World War. History Hit is a bit like Netflix, but purely for history. And we've got hundreds of hours of historical documentaries going all the way back to classical times, right through to the Cold War and beyond. Use the word war stories, all one word, for a massive discount when you join up. A war of numbers. Men. Ammunition. Guns. Ships. Aircraft. Quantity is the difference between victory and defeat. And for the first time in history, everything is recorded in exacting detail. A billion artillery shells. A million machine guns. 50 billion bullets. 65 million men at war who die at a rate of 6,000 a day. A war of numbers, fought by calculating generals for whom no cost is too high. The First World War is almost a year and a half old. The scale of death and destruction has already reached shocking levels. But things are about to get worse. Much worse. 1916 is the year of Verdun. And the killing fields of the Somme. Millions will die. In terms of sheer carnage, it is understandable why the year 1916 has been dubbed a descent into hell. January 1916. Bogged down in the trenches, neither side has achieved a significant breakthrough. Generals decide that the only way they can begin making gains is to overwhelm their enemy with numbers. Vast numbers. The numbers are staggering. The scale is going to be carnage almost unimaginable. The conflict has become a numbers game. In a war started by monarchs and aristocrats, ordinary men have become sacrificial pawns. If one side orders 100,000 men into battle, the other side will send even more. And if that 100,000 is slaughtered, they will simply send in another 100,000 to be cut down. It was thought to be their role to charge and to die. And over time, they started to count more and more on each other, but trusted less and less the decisions made by generals. The men marching to war in 1916 are very different to those who were there at the start. A lot of the old professional soldiers had been killed or wounded, so on both sides, many of the new forces were made up of more recently trained, less experienced men. We've got a large number of young people to come forward at the start of the war who want to play their part in world history. This is their moment. Europe's ruling classes use forced conscription to expand their armies. From 1914 to 1916, Germany's doubles to over six and a half million. The Habsburgs triples to almost five million. But Britain, France and their allies still massively outnumber the Germanic powers. Traditionally, Britain has kept a small army of professional soldiers. But after losses of 400,000, they need more men. Unlike other European powers, Britain, at first, relies on volunteers. The government makes an appeal to patriotic pride and encourages men to sign up in groups with their friends and workmates in so-called PALS battalions. The idea of forming a PALS battalion is that if the guy that lived next door to you, the guy that worked in a factory with you, the guy that you'd known since school signed up and you could sign up and you'd all go together, that it would make you more likely to volunteer for war. The PALS recruitment drive is a resounding success. 1,500 people signed up from Liverpool alone and then spread to over 50 towns uh, across the United Kingdom. You had the Accrington PALS, you had Salford PALS, 
Powell's battalions weren't necessarily location-based. We had things like the Footballers' Battalion as well. The record set on the busiest day of recruitment numbers 33,000. But by 1916, flag-waving patriotism has given way to the horrifying realisation of what war means. And the British government introduces forced conscription. In all, 2.3 million British men will be compelled to fight. The group that suffered the most in terms of casualties was definitely the working class. They were on the front lines, they were the Tommies going over the top. 1916's descent into hell begins in February at Verdun, a French border town surrounded by 60 large and small forts. German generals choose Verdun for one simple reason. They want to kill as many French soldiers as possible. There's a huge amount of emotional investment in the town of Verdun for the French people. It represented the frontier zone beyond which lay the territories of Alsace-Lorraine, the two provinces lost to Germany in the War of 1870-71, a stinging humiliation which they were desperate to get revenge for. The chief of the German general staff is Erich von Falkenhayn. His plan is to lure the French into defending Verdun until the last man to defeat the French by killing them. The conception of the Verdun Offensive on the German side, uh, attributed to Falkenhayn, uh, is this concept of Weissbluten, um, some idea that you could bleed France white by choosing a location in which they would throw their forces in and you could destroy them with artillery repeatedly, day after day after day. Germany shifts more weapons to this single battle than any attacking force in military history. They are bringing in so many guns that um, it's a concentration that's never been seen before on the Western Front, or indeed, frankly, in warfare. The Germans assembled 1,200 guns and 2.5 million shells prior to Verdun. So great is the artillery concentration that it requires an entirely new railway line constructed in secret to supply it. 1,300 munitions trains bring the bullets and shells for a German fighting force 106,000 strong. The French were ill-prepared for the coming storm at Verdun. They were distracted by their own offensive preparations at the River Somme, and perhaps they put unwarranted faith in the iconic fortress at Verdun being able to withstand any German assault. Four a.m., Monday morning, February the 21st, 1916. It begins with a massive artillery bombardment, the largest in human history up to this point. Twelve hundred German guns rain down an incredible two million shells on a French defensive line just eight miles wide. So great is the weight of bombardment, so deafening, so overwhelming, that soldiers are reported as losing their minds, desperate for it to end. Not only do the French endure the heaviest artillery bombardment ever, they do it without steel helmets. For them, head protection does not arrive for a further four months much later than their British allies. Foundries in Sheffield have been making steel Brodie helmets since 1915. In 1915, British soldiers on the Western Front received the first of these. This is the Brodie, named after its inventor. This helmet is very simple to make. It's actually stamped cold from a single piece of metal. That means that factories can make them in their tens of thousands. In fact, well over a million are made in the first batch. What happens is there's a die, this shape, and it simply punches in, punching it out in one piece. You trim it, paint it, line it, it's ready to go. It's not the best helmet in the war. They won't stop a bullet, but what they will do is deflect shrapnel balls and they'll deal with falling fragments this means that although the number of head injuries actually go up because they're feeling braver, the number of fatalities goes down. 
At Verdun, when the shelling stops, the troops go in. 80,000 German soldiers advance in the first wave. In places, they outnumber the French by 10 to 1. Within four days, the French have fallen back to their third line of defense. The Germans are tracking the retreat from the skies. The Germans have also assembled the greatest concentration of aircraft yet seen in history, allowing them to dominate the skies above the battlefield. They actually have 168 aircraft, which gives them the ability to control the air, but more important, they can now direct artillery fire, they can locate French reserves moving in, they can allocate resources where they're needed. Air supremacy has emerged as a key component in modern battles. Five days in, and the battle appears to be going all Germany's way. Their next objective is a fort, the most important of the 60 forts protecting Verdun, Fort Douaumont. The French think Fort Douaumont is impregnable, so it just has a token force. Fort Douaumont is considered such a strong position that it only needs, as far as the French are concerned, the equivalent of two platoons, about 50 odd men, to hold it. But the French are wrong. Once German artillery had flattened a ditch that was surrounding Fort Douaumont and allowed German troops to enter, uh, the operation was fairly simple. German generals face a dilemma. According to their plan, they should wait for the French to send reinforcements and kill as many as they can. But now they're tempted to press home their advantage and push on into France. Whichever option they choose, one thing is certain. Hundreds of thousands of men will die. At Verdun, Germany has unleashed the most ferocious bombardment in history and taken Fort Douaumont. The German plan had been to wait for the French to send wave after wave of troops who would be mown down. But the German generals now attempt to take Verdun. They call up more men, throwing half a million into the battle. It is a bad decision, which will cost 300,000 French and German lives. The German commanders became greedy. What this resulted in was not the Germans sitting in defensive positions and mowing down French attackers, but instead both armies becoming locked into a seesaw battle for control of ever more devastated forts. The result was a meat grinder of monumental proportions. German General von Falkenhayn has badly underestimated the determination and spirit of the French. Once certain positions have been lost, to simply admit defeat would have appeared a betrayal of those that have been killed. Von Falkenhayn has made a serious mistake. He's underestimated the strength of French resistance. He also underestimates French military skill. On February the 25th, the master tactician Marshal Philippe Patin takes charge of the French forces. The appointment of Marshal Patin is significant because he approaches this in terms of a ruthless application of what resources are required and the rotation of units so that he's never exhausting one division or one corps, it's a rotated effort. And this is sufficient to absorb the sheer power of the German offensive. Every spare French soldier is sent to push the Germans back. Over the entire battle of 330 French infantry regiments, 259 fight at Verdun. Patin also persuades his political masters to give him more artillery, turning the tables on the Germans, who take a pounding. Patin assembles a truly impressive counter-battery force of French artillery, and in an ironic twist, it is the German infantry that finds itself thrown against French artillery concentrations, suffering horrendous casualties. By the end of April, the battle has inflicted huge losses on both sides. France has lost 131,000 men. The Germans, 120,000. 
von Falkenhayn expects the French to hurl themselves against the Germans and die in large numbers as a result. What he gets instead is a two-way attritional battle where his troops attack as often as they defend and both Germans and French suffer ruinous casualties together. Von Falkenhayn had planned the speedy slaughter of the French, but Verdun instead becomes an almost year-long killing zone for both sides. Shells fired number at least 40 million. Casualty figures are unprecedented. On average, both sides lose 1,000 men a day, a staggering 700,000 in all. First one side take the upper hand, then the other. The battle seesawed over its 10-month duration. Some villages changed hands up to 15 times as they were first captured by the Germans and then liberated by the French. Just as industrial production has changed war on land, so a new generation of ships will do the same at sea. Another momentous battle is about to begin. It will be fought off the Danish peninsula of Jutland. The Battle of Jutland is a clash between the most powerful weapon systems in the world. The largest, most heavily armed and most heavily armoured ships in human history to this point are about to engage one another. It's also the only time that British and German dreadnought battleships exchange fire with one another. Britain's dominance at sea is hurting Germany. A highly effective British naval blockade is starving the German people of food and German industry of raw materials. In early 1916, the German high seas fleet is told it's time to smash it. What can the expensive, much lauded high seas fleet do to break this blockade? Germany's big problem is the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy is the first line of defence for an island nation, they police the seas, they don't call her the senior service for nothing. In 1914, the Royal Navy's fleet is almost twice the size of Germany's. At Jutland, the numbers involved are slightly more balanced, but the Royal Navy's force is still a third larger. British warships number 151, Germany's 99. British naval dominance is not new. What is new are the battleships being built in British and German dockyards. The revolution begins when in 1906 the Royal Navy launches HMS Dreadnought, a mighty new killing machine for the industrial age. HMS Dreadnought was armed with 10 12-inch naval guns, able to fire at ranges of up to 20,000 yards. And it was quick. HMS Dreadnought was driven by modern steam turbines, which allowed it to move at an unprecedented speed of up to 21 knots. Dreadnought lends its name to a new class of heavily armed, very dangerous and very expensive battleship. In today's money, each costs over £300 million to build. At the start of the war, the Germans have 16 compared to Britain's 28. Despite having fewer ships, Germany wants to take on Britain's fleet, but not all at once. The High Seas Fleet does not want a pitched battle with the entire Royal Navy. What it wants to do is isolate a small portion of the Royal Navy, a squadron perhaps, and destroy it, and then retreat back to its bases before the bulk of the Royal Navy can arrive to extract retribution. The Germans hope to weaken the Royal Navy by ambushing its 52-strong battlecruiser squadron before the 99 ships of the main fleet can join them. But the Germans are communicating in a code which has been deciphered by the British. Unbeknownst to the Germans, the Royal Navy had a crucial intelligence advantage. The British not only managed to capture the German code books, they'd also managed to keep it secret. So the Germans had no idea that the British were reading their signals. A Royal Navy group of cryptographers known as Room 40 were reading German naval traffic, and they knew of the German manoeuvres before the German fleet had even left harbour. 
But when the two fleets come face to face, that intelligence will count for little. What follows is so devastating, it will be the last battle of its kind in military history. Northern Germany, May the 31st, 1916, 1 a.m. A scouting group of 40 German ships leave port. They are followed an hour later by 59 ships of the German high seas fleet. The British are already at sea. At 2.20 p.m., the German scouts are spotted. West of Jutland, Royal Navy battlecruiser HMS Galatea signals, enemy in sight. This is the moment the Royal Navy has been waiting for for the entire war. The British battlecruisers give chase to the scouting ships. The British are being lured toward Germany's main high seas fleet. By the time they realize, it's too late. Though outnumbered at the outset of the battle, the Germans have the best of the fighting. The advantage lies with them. The visibility favors the German gunners, and they are able to rain accurate fire upon the pursuing British battlecruisers. With the sun behind them, the British battlecruisers are easy targets for the German guns. And so begins one of the most terrible naval conflicts in military history. The epic Battle of Jutland begins with a German direct hit on HMS Lion, the flagship of the British battlecruiser fleet. It blows the roof off a gun turret. The blast rips through the turret's armor and penetrates as far as the ammunition chamber. Of 101 men working here, 99 are killed instantly. There are only two survivors, one of whom is Major Francis Harvey. Mortally wounded, he gives the order for the turret to be flooded, with himself still in it, to put out the fire and prevent a catastrophic explosion that would surely have destroyed the flagship. Until this war, the naval battle in British history that has cost the most lives is Trafalgar. 14 times as many Royal Navy sailors will die in the Battle of Jutland. Within minutes, HMS Indefatigable and HMS Queen Mary both sink with the loss of 2,200 lives. Massive explosions are ripping the ships apart. Despite their giant guns and tons of armor, the British ships have an Achilles heel. British battlecruisers are proving to be uh, extremely vulnerable. And part of the reason for this is that large amounts of, of cordite propellants are being kept next to the guns. There's a reason why the British battlecruisers blew up at the Battle of Jutland. Cordite was retained in large silk bags, like this tiny fragment I've got here. This actually is 100 years old. Got to imagine, every time you fire one of these guns, cordite is consumed, the bag simply vaporizes. At the normal rate of fire, you bring up one projectile, one bag. At Jutland, to speed up the firing, they did away with all those protocols, and they packed the turrets with projectiles and propellants. What that meant was that if a German shell hit the turret, and there was a shower of fragments, even just the tiniest bit of red-hot metal, something like this would happen. As Britain's beleaguered battlecruisers make their escape, the German ships follow. But now they, in turn, are lured into an encounter with the main British fleet. The lead German battleships emerge from this swirling mist of gun smoke only to see the British fleet lined up right against them and they're looking straight down their barrels. For the Germans, it's almost a hands-up moment. But the British are just as surprised, giving the Germans just enough time to make a swift about turn and disappear back into the mist. If only they had responded quicker, they could have wiped out the German fleet in one blow. It should have been an utter annihilation, but the British hesitated, and as a result, the Germans were able to take advantage of all that mist and smoke, and with some skillful manoeuvring, managed to make their escape. He turned away from the British fleet and escaped into the darkness. 
The Battle of Jutland was a shock to both fleets. 25 ships and 8,500 lives were lost. The tally suggests a German success. In paper terms, the Battle of Jutland appeared to be a German victory. It was the bloodiest battle ever fought by the Royal Navy, and they lost more ships than their German opponents. All told, the Germans sank 14 British ships and killed 6,000 crew. The Germans lost 11 ships and 2,500 men. But the heavy losses mattered so much more to the Germans. The Germans simply don't have the capacity to lose any more ships in a full-scale battle. The German Navy is now absolutely crippled, and as a result, they now have to fall back on the use of U-boats. So ultimately, Britain is the victor of Jutland. Jutland lasts just 36 hours. But the bloody land battles of 1916 are lasting for months. Across Europe, they will change the course of history, and nowhere more radically than on the Eastern Front. In a year, the Tsarist regime will be overthrown in a revolution. But in 1916, for a time, the Russian army seems to be riding high, thanks to a brilliant aristocratic general who will soon join the Red Army. Alexei Brusilov is a pioneer of a new kind of warfare, which will culminate in the Nazi blitzkrieg. The Brusilov Offensive is named after its architect, General Alexei Brusilov. He was known as the broom to his soldiers due to the fact that he was tall, thin and had spiky hair. But on the eve of the Brusilov Offensive, he would acquire a new nickname, the New Broom, because he brought new ideas that swept away many of the old, inefficient methods the Russian army had been using. In 1915, half a million Russian men had been slaughtered as the Tsar was driven out of Poland. The Tsar sent them into battle with just two rifles for every three men. Almost a year on, General Brusilov has seen to it that Russian troops under his command are properly armed and equipped. He plans to use them to attack the armies of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Germany's allies, along a 200-mile front in modern-day Ukraine. Brusilov is a clever tactician. He sends out planes to photograph the enemy's lines, calculating the distance of key targets with forensic accuracy. He will use his artillery to devastate the enemy's rear supply lines and forward defensive positions. And when the battle begins, Brusilov wants his soldiers to be close enough to see the whites of the enemy's eyes. Brusilov's army burrow their way towards the Austro-Hungarian trenches in what are called Russian saps, forward trenches that extend into no man's land. In some cases, these saps are able to get within 10 yards of the Austro-Hungarian line. General Brusilov assembles a massive force, over 600,000 troops and almost 2,000 artillery guns. But the Austro-Hungarian armies are also huge, at least 500,000 troops and only slightly fewer big guns. Conventional military wisdom says that to be successful, an attacking force should be at least twice as big as the defending force. Brusilov's slim numerical advantage is nowhere near enough. But Brusilov is about to change the rules of war. As usual, the battle will start with a massive artillery bombardment. But this one is different. One of Brusilov's new ideas is to use a hurricane bombardment rather than a slow, prolonged, methodical artillery assault. Rather than shell enemy lines for days, Brusilov orders a hurricane bombardment, lasting just hours. The hurricane bombardment completely stuns the Austro-Hungarian defenders, who expect the bombardment to last five, six, or even seven days. And when the bombardment lifts suddenly and abruptly, they are in no way prepared to defend their positions from the Russian infantry that comes swarming across the parapets. The infantry are up and forward onto the Austrian positions before they have a chance to counterattack, or indeed, in some cases, even emerge from their dugouts to fight off the Russian attack. Brusilov's strategy results in one of the most lethal offensives in military history. By the end of day two, the Russians have advanced 50 miles and captured 26,000 prisoners. 
This is an extraordinary victory for the Russian army. The first 48 hours of the Brusilov Offensive are the most devastating assault ever launched on the Central Powers on the Eastern Front. Brusilov's army pushes on, taking 200,000 more prisoners. Austrian commander Archduke Joseph Ferdinand only just manages to escape, but his army suffers casualties of 600,000 men as he desperately calls up reinforcements. The imperial forces of Austro-Hungary will never be the same again. Within two years, the empire will collapse. The effect of the Brusilov Offensive is to neutralize the ability of the Austrians to have any real fighting power uh, of an offensive nature for the rest of the war. They are on the defensive. But the rapid Russian advance also highlights its own army's frailty. Its supply lines are overextended to breaking point. The Russian imperial forces certainly suffer from infrastructural weaknesses. The railway system is beginning to collapse. The logistical chain is failing. To make matters worse, Germany turns its attention from Verdun and sends eight divisions east to take on Russia. The German reaction to the Brusilov Offensive is pretty critical because the arrival of fresh German divisions is sufficient to turn the tide. And once the Russians lose the initiative and go on the back foot, it makes it much easier for the Germans to sustain this counter-offensive, such that by the end of the campaign, the Russians find themselves pretty much near their start point. Brusilov's lightning offensive is a stunning military victory, but the cost in Russian lives is horrific. Up to one million are lost. To satisfy the Tsar's vain imperial ambitions, Lives are being thrown away like confetti. And Russian generals struggle to supply and feed those who survive. The entire Russian war effort by the December of 1916 is in dire straits. All of this culminates in a sense of despair, increasing anger, disillusionment amongst ordinary Russian soldiers. A dozen regiments mutiny. No fewer than 58,000 Russian soldiers desert. Even the aristocrat Brusilov blames the plight of his troops on the Tsarist system. The winds of change are blowing in the east. Revolution is coming. Meanwhile in the west, it is the turn of Britain to take on the German forces in France. It will result in a battle so terrifying, it will become one of the most famous in human history. The Somme. Saturday, July the 1st, 1916. 7.30 in the morning. It should be the start of a glorious summer's day. But in a moment, the Battle of the Somme will begin. Within hours, the world will have changed forever. It is still the blackest day in British Army history. Thousands die on the first day alone. The idea behind the Somme is simple. It's about a British offensive aimed at relieving the French at Verdun. In order to relieve pressure on the French, it was necessary the British find a place where they could launch their own offensive, possibly in conjunction with other French troops, to draw German reserves from Verdun up to the north. The British bombardment lasts seven whole days. The generals aim to kill as many entrenched Germans as possible and destroy the rows of barbed wire protecting enemy lines. To do that, they fire an incredible 1.7 million shells. What I've got here is the standard British 18-pounder shrapnel shell. This one is designed to explode not when it hits the ground, it goes off on a timer. You pick your target, you work out when you want it to detonate. And when you do that, you're able to set a timer here from 0 seconds to 22 seconds. At 22 seconds, this thing will activate roughly 9,000 yards from the firing point. When that happens, it actually fires out of the nose over 360 metallic balls over an area the size of a modern tennis court. If you're caught in the open, you've probably had it. When the bombardment ends, 
the troops stand ready to go in. 120,000 British soldiers have been assembled, many of them volunteers who have never fought in combat. One can only imagine what emotions the ordinary soldiers waiting in the trench to go over the top must have felt. Anticipation, fear, resolution, fatalism. It was not uncommon to write a last letter to your loved one, to leave your watch and your wedding ring behind. General Haig believes the scale of his artillery bombardment means that not even a rat will be alive in the German trenches. Haig and the British High Command were very optimistic. They thought that this was going to work. In fact, Haig referred to it as the big push. By a few weeks in, the soldiers started to call it the big F up. To make doubly sure that the German trenches will be empty, the British have a secret weapon. The Royal Engineers were tasked with digging a series of shallow trenches towards the German defenses. And there, at the end of these trenches, they lay a series of 19 huge mines. 7.28 a.m., the mines are detonated. The largest, containing 60,000 pounds of explosive, blows a crater 140 meters wide, obliterating nine German dugouts. When these mines go off, the noise is so loud, it's said to be the loudest man-made noise ever made, and it could be heard, apparently, in London. But rather than kill the enemy, the gigantic mines only serve to alert them. It's like a signal to the Germans. They know what's going to happen next. The British are going to advance. 7.30 a.m., zero hour, the whistles blow. British troops stream over the top. The result is carnage on the most horrific scale. It's going to be the bloodiest day in British history. General Haig could not have been more wrong. The shells have failed. Not only are the trench rats still alive, so are the Germans. On the Somme, when over a million of these things are fired, the enemy are in trenches, they're in dugouts. It doesn't touch them. It looks effective, it isn't. Though it was horrific and the Germans suffered a lot, a lot of the time they were far, far below ground and although mentally they were ravaged by this bombardment, physically they were still able to come out and fight when the British went over the top. And worse still, one of the jobs of these shells on the Somme was cutting barbed wire. It proves to be almost totally ineffectual against wire. British soldiers advance into a hail of bullets. Those who manage to get any distance become caught on barbed wire. As they struggle helplessly to break free, the German machine guns turn on them. The British artillery fire was uh, simply too imprecise to take out all the machine gun positions that were dispersed along the front lines. German machine gunners squeeze the trigger and swing their guns, snuffing out lives, with the horrifying ease of a crop sprayer exterminating pests. The scale is almost unimaginable. 57,000 casualties on the first day, 19,000 dead. One soldier is going to die every five seconds. Whole Powell's battalions are wiped out. The communities from which they were recruited will be devastated. In some areas, it will seem a whole generation of men are lost. Sons, lovers, husbands, fathers. Accrington's a good example. 75% at least of the men have been either killed wounded or missing in action. So there's not a street in Accrington that hasn't been hugely affected by the opening day of the Battle of the Somme. 720 Accrington pals fight that day. Just 136 survive. It's not just common soldiers. On the first day, three quarters of the officers leading them into battle are killed or injured. Officers led from the front with a pistol in one hand and a whistle in the other. So they were right at the front of these attacks. Britain's Imperial Officer class had been among the most enthusiastic supporters of the war. 
their numbers swelled by recruits from Britain's elite private schools looking forward to the adventure. But this class too will be devastated. Even before the end of 1914, you find George V exclaiming that all of our friends are dying in this horrible war. This was the literate class, the class that would go into politics, uh, the natural leaders of society. By 1916, the composition of the officer class in particular had changed significantly. Instead of aristocrats, you're having to go to the middle classes and even below to find officers to lead men. Undoubtedly, both in terms of a percentage of a demographic and even individuals killed, you can say that the losses amongst the aristocracy had an impact on British society. As thousands of men are sacrificed, thousands more are sent to replace them. The Somme becomes another bloody, futile stalemate. In an effort to break it, the British introduce a new, spectacular weapon of war. The Battle of the Somme saw the arrival of a major military innovation, the tank. The official name of the tank was the landship, but when they were being built, they resembled large water tanks. That's very much what they looked like as they were being put together. And so they started being called tanks in order to maintain the secrecy around them. And that name has stuck ever since. 28 tons, a top speed of 3.7 miles per hour. The British Mark I tank is armed with two six-pounders and three machine guns. On September the 15th, 1916, the tank spearhead an Allied assault on Fleur Corselette. 36 managed to reach the front line. But the tanks are so hopelessly unreliable, only a few penetrate the German trenches. Just six tanks were able to reach their objectives. The remainder suffered a variety of mechanical breakdowns or became ditched in the shell holes and mud between the trenches. Most broke down, some lost their way, and even fired on their own men. But the new tanks did land one important psychological blow to the enemy. It put the fear of God into them. The tank represented a new and terrible manifestation of industrial warfare. As they came clanking and grinding through the smoke and fire of the battlefield, bullets simply bounced off them, while their own halls were lit with gun flashes as their many weapons engaged the German defenders. For the German infantry facing these oncoming behemoths, there seemed to be no weapon that could harm them, and they were forced to flee, in some cases, in absolute terror from these metal monsters. During the war, Britain and France will produce 6,500 tanks. The Germans show little interest and make only 20. And they do eventually figure out how to disable them. By the Battle of Amiens in 1918, the Allies will have over 500 tanks. At the end of the first day, only 30% are still in action. The tank makes no significant impact at the Somme, which ends on Saturday, November the 18th, 1916. The British have lost 420,000 men. The French, 200,000. But in the end, the Germans suffer most, losing over 600,000. In all, 1.2 million men killed or wounded. And for what? Temporary possession of a small area of blood-drenched farmland. It is difficult to assign victory or defeat to the Battle of the Somme. It was a battle so vast and so costly that it is not easily classified. The experienced core of the pre-war German army died in the mud of the Somme, and the battle from there on would be borne increasingly by inexperienced conscripts. In 1916, combat casualties alone amount to over seven and a half million killed or wounded. And for all that sacrifice, the territory occupied by the competing imperial powers remains largely unchanged. War weariness is setting in, not only in the trenches, but at home. You'd 
put everything into 1916, you thought you were going to end the war, and you realise that actually, no, it's going to go on for at least another year. We're going to go into 1917, and we're actually going to have to do all of this again next year. And the hardship is going to continue, the casualties are going to continue. And I think for that reason, at the beginning of 1917, there's a really subdued atmosphere and a real war weariness setting in at home.